thank you. Let us pray together. God, you know better than we do how much we need leadership through the storms and through the fog of life. We need your comfort. We need your presence. We need your peace. We need your strength. Thank you for loving us in our storms. Thank you for loving us in our frail times. Thank you for being with us when our hearts are weak and our strength is slipping away. And thank you for telling us, even in song, that you will be faithful to lead us on so that we can be your people in even in these moments. Through Christ we pray, amen. We do not often think about this, but have you ever thought about how important it is to know what we see and to be recognized by the people who see us. Parents know as one of the great joys of parenthood that special feeling that comes the first time their child recognizes their touch, their voice, their presence, their scent. And do you recall that first time you heard your child say, Mama or Dada? Do you recall the feeling you got when you realized they see me? They recognize me. And do you recall? He said, Dad, Dad, today. He said, Mama, today. Do you recall? Show them how you can say Daddy. Show them how you can say Mommy. You're waiting. She, he did, she did say it. She did say it. She did say it. Just wait. She's going to say it again. She's going to say it. And do you recall what happened when she said it? I told you. And the word goes out. Not just that the baby spoke, but that the baby knew what he or she saw. There was a special feeling of knowing. And do you recall how the baby responded when the baby heard you call its name? Do you recall when the baby saw you come in the room, how the baby lit up? How the baby acted when you walked away and then came back. Recognizing, knowing what we see is important. It's important to know the difference between a worm and a snake. It's important to know the difference between a match and a mirror. It's important to know the difference between a cat and a mouse. Do you recall how important it was for the child to be able to say, cat, dog, car, how 
spouse? Do you recall how important it was for the child to know their address? Know their phone number? What's your daddy's name? What's your mama's name? Knowing what we see opens a door to a whole lot of future knowings. And we deal with that reality again and again and again in life, and often we take it for granted. We take for granted how important it is to know what we see. Hmm. What does that have to do with this passage from Ezekiel? Ezekiel was a priest who was taken into exile in Babylon. He was a priest. He was a religious official, a leader in worship. He was part of the worship establishment in his homeland. And then his people were conquered by the Babylonians, and Ezekiel was one of the first group. Ezekiel was one of the first group to be taken into exile in Babylon in around 605 B.C. And while in Babylon, he sensed the Spirit of God calling him in, into a different role. Remember, he was a priest in his homeland. He went to Babylon as a priest. But this passage we read has Ezekiel recognizing that he is being called into a different role. Hmm. This passage from Ezekiel 2 is, a, is an excerpt from his call as, as, as a prophet. The first three chapters of Ezekiel are part of his call. And several important items stick out in this passage we read today. First, this term mortal. In the King James Version, son of man. It, it's, just, it's just the term that the Spirit of God used to describe Ezekiel. Think human. Human. Why is it important that the Spirit impresses Ezekiel about his humanity? To remind Ezekiel that he is He's not God. <laughs> He's not God. It's important to know your place. <laughs> it's important to know who you are. It's especially important to know who you are in the hierarchy of God. I am not God. You are not God. We are not God. It's important for us to realize who we are. And the Spirit constantly imports to Ezekiel. You read throughout the book this term, mortal or son of man. Don't forget who you are. You are human. You're part of human. And the important thing about that is even in your humanity you have conversation with divinity. Hmm. Even in your humanity I'm talking to you. God is talking to you. I am human, yet I am able to commune with the divine. I am human. I'm not God. You're not God. But we have hmm, divine interactions. When I was a child, And I still enjoy this. I enjoyed science fiction movies. One of my favorite science fiction movies was Close Encounters. Oh, I remember. Somebody else remember Close Encounters. Remember Close Encounters? The, 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 the notion that, 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 that these little children understood, we are not alone in the universe. And do, do you remember E.T.? Remember E.T.? 
the extraterrestrial, the notion that we are not alone. It's important for us to understand that we are not alone in the universe and that God is getting through to us. Human, I am sending you. Mortal, you're not divine, but you have the potential to do something that has divine importance. I am talking to you because you matter. You matter in my plans, human. You matter in my understanding of what I want to do, human. Human, don't forget who you are. You matter to me, says the Spirit of God. Hmm, I wonder if you know what you see when you look in the mirror. Do you know that when you look in the mirror, you are looking at a person who God wants to speak to and who God wants to speak through? Hello. I know we read about Ezekiel and we think Ezekiel is this prophetic person, but understand the word mortal reminds us that as... God spoke to Ezekiel and through Ezekiel, God has the potential to speak to and through us. I'm coming somewhere with that in just a minute. I am sending you. I am sending you. Mortal, I am sending you. These words explain how and why Ezekiel said what he said and did what he did. Ezekiel understood he was God's agent. He realized that he was on a mission. I love this line from the Blues Brothers. I'm quoting the movies where Jake and Elrod go into this soul food restaurant. You recall the scene where the cook is, Aretha Franklin's got, runs the restaurant, but she's got her husband there and he's, guitar player and they want to recruit the guitar player to come play him and no 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 and she said no he's not leaving here because we got the rest and 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 jake said, no we're on a mission from god <laughs> now it sounded funny but you need to understand that what Zeke and Elrod said, is the same thing Ezekiel saying in this passage. I am sending you. I'm on a mission. You're on a mission from God. Hmm. Do you know who you are? Do you know why you're here? Do you know who you are? Do you know who you, why you're here? Do you know that you are on a mission from God? Do you know that you're not just here to have a job? You're not just here to draw a paycheck. You're not just here to take up space on terra firma for a while. You are on a mission from God. Do you know what you see? Hmm. Do you know who you are? Do you know what God is up to? There it is. You're on a mission from God, Jake says. And then the question comes, hmm. I am sending you to the house of Israel, a rebellious house. I am sending you to the, a house of Israel, to the people of Israel. I'm not sending you to strangers. I'm sending you to the same people you came over here with. These are folks who you know and folks who know you. These are people who speak your language. These are people whose stories you know. You know their history. I'm sending you to people with whom you are politically and culturally related. You share their sense of separation from home and kinfolk. You are not being sent to aliens. You're sent to people who you know, but let me remind you of their moral and ethical character. They are a nation of rebels. Hmm. 
Hmm. The Spirit emphasized that. When you read in the Old Testament repetition, that's emphasis. In the Hebrew, there is no, the Hebrew language does not have adjectives like good, better, best. And so to, to, to emphasize something, to underscore something, the bigness, the importance of it, you get in Hebrew repetition. Look at how often times you see rebellious house in that passage. I am sending you to a nation of rebels. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn, hmm. as if to say, in case you don't understand what I understand, let me tell you what I know. I am sending you to them. I'm not sending you to some folks who are obedient. I'm not sending you to people who have a reputation for doing right. I'm not sending you to, a to people who have a history of following my will. I am sending you to people I know to be rebellious. It's important for Ezekiel to know what he was getting into. Know what he would be doing. Know the moral and ethical character of the people he'd be addressing. He needed to know that his society was rebellious. He needed to know he was being intentionally sent by God. God was not making a mistake. God was not confused. When Ezekiel would encounter people later on who didn't listen to him, God did not want Ezekiel thinking, wait a minute. God must have had the wrong mission. Ezekiel didn't realize he was being intentionally sent to a society of people who had a long and stubborn history of defying the love and justice imperatives of God. He needed to know the truth about the people he was being commissioned to deal with for God. He was not being sent to God obeying people. He was not being sent to God honoring people. He was not being sent to God-trusting people. He was not being sent to repentant people. Allow me to paraphrase. Ezekiel, I'm sending the people, sending you to people who you might be tempted to consider devout and God-loving. So let's get something straight about your people. Let me get something straight about your people. No, you don't see, I'm sending you to my people. I'm sending you to a house of rebels. Let me tell you about your people. Your people, because they don't act like my people. Your people, because they don't act like my people. So let me tell you what your people are. Your people are rebels. They are a nation of rebels against divine authority. They are a nation of rebels against divine instruction. They are a nation of rebels against divine correction. Whenever you see them, Ezekiel, whenever you speak to them, however you deal with them, know that you are dealing with rebels. Whether they have a confederate flag or not, They're rebels. Whether they tell you they hate my will or not, they're rebels. Whether they sing or pray or not, they are rebels. Because Ezekiel, I've been watching them. I have been monitoring them. I know them. Know you are dealing with stubborn and impudent, the King James Version says, you're dealing with stiff-necked people. We don't use that term anymore, but those of, those of, of a certain age remember stiff-necked. You're dealing with arrogant people. You're dealing with wrong-headed and wrong-minded people. Know that these people didn't become rebellious recently. They didn't just now get this way. They get this, this in the DNA, Ezekiel. 
they and their ancestors were this way. Their moral and their ethical DNA is disobedient and unloving. I'm talking about your people, Ezekiel. Know that your people, Ezekiel, aren't rebellious against divine authority by accident. They're rebellious on purpose. And no, they're not rebellious because they got whipped by the Babylonians. They can't blame this on the Babylonians. They are conquered and displaced as a divine judgment on their rebellious character. Don't forget who they are, Ezekiel. And don't you forget who you are. Don't let the fact that you share history with these people mess you up. You represent me, Ezekiel. You represent me. These people are rebellious against me. They're not rebellious against you. Don't get it twisted. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to pay attention, but don't get it twisted. Remember, you are mortal. These are your people. Don't get this twisted. They're rebellious against me. Know this always. You need to know this. You need to know what I'm talking about, your people, so you won't get messed up when they don't do right. Because you see, whether these people listen to you or not, uh, did I tell you they were rebellious people? Did you? Know that they're a rebellious house. Whether they act like they are paying attention or not, know they are a rebellious house. Whether they like you or not, know they are a rebellious house. You need to know this up front and know it at all times. This knowledge will keep you from going off the deep end. This knowledge will keep you from thinking your work is for nothing when the people don't heed your messages. Whether they listen to you or not, did I tell you they were rebellious, Ezekiel? Remember your people, Ezekiel, are a rebellious house. And when you speak my truth to them, they will be a rebellious house. But you speak my truth, whether they listen and heed or not, because they are a rebellious house. But I want you to speak my truth in case you're one Ezekiel, so they will know that there was a problem. Hmm. This message is important if we are to understand the whole book of Ezekiel, but it's important for other reasons. It's important for us to understand the whole way that God works with humans through prophetic people. If you ever wondered how and why Martin Luther King kept doing what he did, understand this text. And today, being April 15, it is important that you remember this text in light of the life of A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph. So, somebody say, A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph. Okay, who was A. Philip Randolph? A. Philip Randolph was the head of the very first black union in this country, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Born April 15, 1889 in Crescent City, Florida. Devoted his adult, entire life in adult, adult life to courageous leadership, nonviolent leadership, activism for black workers to receive fairness. He formed the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in 1929. He threatened to lead the very first march on Washington, not in 1963, but in the 1940s. In the 1940s, and that threat is what caused President Franklin Roosevelt to ban race discrimination in defense factories because black workers were being discriminated against in defense factories. And so A. Philip Randolph said, well, if you're not going to do anything, we're going to have black folks show up in Washington, D.C. in the middle of this war. And President Roosevelt said, if you, don't, if you, won't, if you won't make them show up, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, end the, I'll end discrimination. And so black folks got into defense factories as employment. A. Philip Randolph kept pushing, and in 1948, President Harry Truman banned racial segregation in the U.S. military. 
that's why we have an integrated military because A. Philip Randolph kept pushing, kept being a prophet. The 1963 march on Washington would not have happened had it been for A. Philip Randolph because he was the prime mover for that march. You know what the title of that march was? A March for Jobs and Freedom. We think about the march, and remember, I have a dream speech. Martin Luther King wouldn't have had a speech place if A. Philip Randolph hadn't said, I'm bringing workers and civil rights activists to Washington, D.C. to show the nation in the hard times of segregation that we have people, hundreds of thousands of people, who are protesting segregation and are protesting discrimination in employment. And because of that, in 1964, we had the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which has a provision that outlaws job discrimination based on race, religion, national origin, and sex. A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph pushed, and we got a Voting Rights Act. Yes, we remember Dr. King. Remember Selma, but A. Philip Randolph had the black labor union movement, and he was pushing the, the white labor unions, too. Mr. Randolph often displeased the white labor unions because the white labor unions wouldn't let black folks in. And he displeased them, but that didn't stop him. He knew he was dealing with a rebellious house. And we should remember Mr. Randolph as one of God's prophets for the same reason we cherish Dr. King's memory. Mr. Randolph devoted his life to doing justice. He did not allow fear of opposition or offers of favor to discredit him or discourage him or unsettle him from trying to do justice. And like Ezekiel, A. Philip Randolph knew that this society needed to be confronted and challenged about this long-standing history of being disobedient to God's love, of being racist, of being mistreating workers, of its hypocrisy about justice. Well, we remember Dr. King as a prophet, we remember A. Philip Randolph as a prophet, but do we know our present prophets? Do you recall the word to Ezekiel was, whether they listen or not, they will know there is a prophet. Hmm. The brokers of power and the captains of capitalism and the peddlers of influence knew they were dealing with prophets when they dealt with Martin King. They didn't like it, <laughs> but they knew. They knew they were dealing with prophets when they dealt with A. Philip Randolph. They knew they were dealing with prophets when they dealt with Fannie Lou Hamer. Hmm. But do we know that we are supposed to be prophets? Do we know that we are God's prophetic people? Do we know that the Great Commission is not a directive to go peddle a go-to-heaven religion? but it is a commandment to go lead the world, challenge the world to embrace and follow the prophet called Jesus, the prophet of love and justice and peace and compassion. You understand there's a difference between a go to heaven religion and a religion of justice. You understand if you gotta go to heaven religion, you say it's okay for us to give people hell here if they can get heaven over yonder. But when we understand that God has called us to be prophets of justice, when we understand that eternal life is not over yonder, but is here, eternal means all the time, you understand. We are in eternity. Eternity is not later. Let me think this way. Have you thought of later air? Think of later air, okay? You can't think of later air, can you? You either have air or you don't have air. 
You don't have later air. You don't have past air. You don't have present air. You just got air. And, and, and eternal life is life now. Do we know what we're seeing? Do we know who we are? Do we know who God has called us to be? Well, let me say over with you, we still got another prophet. May I suggest to you that Colin Kaepernick is a prophet? I'm not, I messed up now. I know I messed up. I messed up, I know. Because you see, somebody said, how can a football player be a prophet? Understand that Colin Kaepernick, like Martin King, like A. Philip Randolph, refuses to back down or be silenced about the ongoing and state-sanctioned slaughter of black, brown, and poor white people. He refuses to promise to be a puppet for the imperialism and the racism and the violence and the hypocrisy that goes up when we stand up and sing the national anthem. He refused to act like he's got to pretend he does not know what he knows and pretend that God does not know what he knows, and pretend that God does not care what he knows. He refused to go along and get along because he knows who he is, and he knows that the society in which he lives is a nation of rebels against God's love, against God's peace, against God's justice, against God's truth, and so because he knows who he is, he knows how he must act. You understand, if you don't know who you are, you won't know how you're supposed to live. It has been many years since I was a child, but I remember something that I heard my parents say often during my childhood to me and my sister and brother. Do not forget who you are. Do not forget who you are. Do we know like Martin King, like Ezekiel, like A. Philip Randolph, like Colin Kaepernick, who we are. Do we know that we are God's prophetic people? Do we know that the Great Commission is actually a commission for us to be prophets? Ezekiel was already a priest. He already had a prayer life. Hello, hello, hello. He already had a Bible. God didn't call him to get a Bible. He called him to be prophetic. He already had a religion. God called him to make his religion relevant. Do we know who we are? Do we know what we're seeing? Do we know who God has called us to be? If so, let's get about God's business. Amen. Sometimes we don't see how they could struggle that break our hearts in two. Sometimes blind us to the truth.
Just.